So one of the most important things to know in life is how the money system works. And when you know that, then it's about knowing how to play it, that money system so that you win at it. So this is information that should be taught in schools, but it isn't. And I think the reason it's not is because parts of the money system have players in it that benefit if you don't know how it works. Now, for most people, they, they never learn how, about how it works. And so they get trapped in the system, repeating the same mistakes over and over again, but never understanding why things aren't working. Without having this understanding of how the money system works, you get trapped working in a job you don't like, paying for things that you might have wanted at one time, but you're still paying for them five years later. This isn't going to be a technical video. I've designed it in a way that, that even a five-year-old can hopefully understand it. And by the way, I, I do talk quite fast for some people. If you're struggling to keep up with me, then you can just reduce the playback speed on the video. So let's get into it. I've created over 400 videos on different subjects, but out of all of those, this is probably the most important one out of any of them. If this is the only video you watch, you're, you're far above 98% of the rest of the population. Unless you understand this part and how it works in your own life, it doesn't matter what you do in your own life, you'll always have the same problems. This is, this is the foundation for everything. It doesn't matter how much you earn in, in your job. It doesn't matter if you win the lottery. You'll always have this same problem. If you look at most lottery winners, so, some people have won 50 million pounds and within five years they've gone bankrupt and, and lost the whole lot. And it's because they hadn't got this foundation piece sorted out first. So let's get started on, on how to understand this in your own life. So if we think about our, our bank account, we have three parts to it. How much money we have coming in, how much money we have going out to pay our bills, and then how much is left over when those bills are paid. I've included a free spreadsheet you can use. Just click the link below. Uh, you can download it. And to use it, you, you need to go to the top left corner where it says File. Click on that and then click Make a Copy. And then you can save it to your own computer. And you don't need to know, any, know how to use spreadsheets. Or, all that you're going to do is enter your details into the into yellow boxes and the spreadsheet will do everything else. Next, I want you to, to pause the video, go and get your bank statement and enter your different expenses into the spreadsheet and how much you spent. Do that into the, third, into the first yellow column where it says current month. Don't forget to write how much total income you got to at the top. It doesn't matter where, where that income came from. It might be a job. It might be housing benefit. It might be child benefit. Just anything that adds to your bank account. Everything that's in your bank account, I, I want you to transfer all of that into this spreadsheet. And only write in the cells that are called yellow. So pause the video and then come back to this when you've done that. Okay, welcome back. So at the top of each column, you've got a number. Now, if the number is negative or red in color, it means you're going negative every month. It means you're spending more than what's coming in. If the number is positive or if it's green, it means you're ready to, to think about the next stage. But first, let's, let's learn about if it's red, because even if you're positive every month, you still might have an extra expense one month, and then that sends you into the red zone. So you need to know how to get out. So what, what do you do if the spreadsheet says you're negative and you're in that red zone? Well, the simple answer is we need to shift it around and get it positive again. And if this is you, don't worry. This is, this is how most people's spreadsheet look before they, they learn this knowledge. So the two parts we're going to look at are your income and your expenses. So we can either increase our income or we can reduce our expenses. So first of all, how much do you need extra to make that, that number positive? So if the spreadsheet says 120 pounds, you need to get an extra 120 pounds in, in more income or reduce your expenses by 120 pounds or a combination of both. So, so let's look at income to see how you might do that. How might you increase your income? Have a think about different ideas that you could do to increase your income. I'll talk about a few examples. So first of all, you've got earned income. This is how much you earn for every hour you work. So the way to change this number is to either work more hours or to increase how much you earn per hour. So think about ways you might do that. And then next we've got investment income. We'll look at m more of this later, but, but this is what you, what you earn without having to spend your own time. Maybe you spend five hours to do something and then you get paid every month without having to do or spend much time on that again. And, and then finally, you've got taxes. Now, taxes make up about 70% of most people's income. 
and this is both direct taxes like income tax and social social security taxes but also indirect taxes like VAT and import taxes on the things we buy. Now I'm not going to do to go into this on this video but because it's too in depth but there are legal ways to reduce how much of that tax you pay. And so by reducing those taxes you increase your income without doing anything else. So what one way to impact the first two parts of this is to think about what people need. If you know this, you can think about how you might be able to, to provide what they need to them. And then you can invest into learning those, those new skills that you can deliver it. Because you, you don't want to learn skills that, that you can't use to increase your income. So let's look at how, how to impact that second piece, how to reduce your expenses. So I always lump expenses into a few main categories. You've got housing costs, energy costs, vehicle or transport costs, food costs, fashion costs, and then lifestyle and entertainment costs. There are various ways that you can reduce your costs. The first thing I want you to do is pause the video again and go back to your spreadsheet. Go through each item on your expenses and just be, just be really hard on yourself and ask, do I really need this item? Right now, th this process is about really getting back to basics. So the question is, do I need this item for me to survive? If the answer is no, then delete it. And then do whatever you need to do to delete it from your expenses in, in real life. So that might mean canceling a direct debit, for example. If it's a store card, then maybe it's, you cut the store card up so you can't use it. Now, maybe you need certain things like a phone. So so that you can do work or earn an income. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And be really honest with yourself about this. Do, do you really need that Netflix subscription to survive? Do you really, really need that Starbucks coffee every day? If you're not willing to do this part, then switch off the video now because the rest of what I'll share will be completely useless information if you're not willing to, to make these, these initial sacrifices right now. So pause the video and go and do that. Okay, welcome back. So now in your spreadsheet, you should have only the items that you need to either survive or to earn the income that you need. So let's think about how we might be able to reduce those costs a bit more. So there's four main ways I can think of to reduce these costs. The first one, which is the most obvious, can you downsize your expectations? For example, if you've got a mobile phone and you're paying £50 a month for it, there's probably a cheaper way to get the same end result. So, for example, you, you, you might cancel the subscription and get a SIM-only contract. Now, I got this option about 10 years ago because I had an iPhone and I'd come to the end of the contract, but I thought, why do I need to get a new phone? There's just nothing wrong with this one. So, I use a company called Smarty, and I'll leave a link below, but, but with this, I pay monthly. It's still a subscription. I get three megabytes of data every month and 600 minutes of call time, and it cost me £6 a month. So, I went from about £40 a month down to 6 to the exact same thing. The other benefit with this company, if you don't use all your data, you get a refund at the end of the month. So sometimes I only pay two or three pounds a month. So have a look at each of your expenses and think about whether you could use this downsizing method. If you've got a house, is it bigger than what you what you need right now? The problem with having a bigger house is it costs you more on everything. You, you pay more in council tax, you pay more in water bills, in energy costs, everything. The next thing to look at is maybe there's an alternative way to get what you need. Thinking about your house again, is there another way to get what you need? So instead of paying for an entire house, maybe you could share with someone else or maybe even three or four people. Or maybe you could just rent a room from someone. You, you get what you need, which is a roof over your head, but you don't have to find all these extra costs by doing that. This doesn't have to be a long-term way of life. This is just about getting into that, that uh, positive green zone in the spreadsheet. By the way, I wrote a book about 10 years ago talking about how to reduce your energy bills. It was originally aimed at businesses, but you can use the same principles for your own home. So uh, I'll leave a link below for that if you're interested. Let's, let's think about transport. You've, you've probably got a car and you, go from, you use it to go from A to B. Maybe you've got it so you can get to work. But over 10 years ago, I realized that my car was being used for, me, for maybe an hour every day. And then it will just sit either on a driveway or in a car park somewhere. If you add up how much it costs you every year for, for owning it, and then buying road tax, insurance, fuel, washing it, maintaining it, 
buying new tires and then paying for it when it breaks down, divide that number by the total number of hours or the miles that you drive it for. And don't forget to include how much the car depreciates in the time you own it. If you buy a new car in the first three years, that car will lose more than half its value. Even a car that's a few years old, it, that, that will still be losing a few thousand pounds every year. Now think about, is there an alternative way to get where I need to go? First of all, if your car is used mainly for work, maybe you can work from home or somewhere within walking distance. Maybe you can find an employer that, it, that is local to where you live. One of the side benefits of this is by getting rid of a car, you get more exercise, you, you walk more. And if you really need to, you can still get a taxi or, or the bus. I walk everywhere. I live about two miles from the supermarket. So I, I even just walk to that and, and get what I need. If I buy a lot of things, then maybe I'll get a taxi, but that, that costs me less than five pounds each time. So if, if I really wanted to, I could get a taxi every day and, and I'd still pay less money than if I owned or, or even the most basic car. And then if, if I do need a car for a weekend or something like that, I can, I can just go and hire one, which costs about 30 or 40 pound a day. Now, the same, same applies to uh, company cars as well. If you've got a company car from your, your work, that is costing you a fortune in, in tax, extra tax that you don't need to pay. So also, uh, maybe have a conversation with your employer about that because it, it also costs them more money for you to have that car. Next is food. How could you reduce the cost of your food expenses? First of all, are you buying more than you need to buy? Some of the easiest and fastest ways to reduce your food expenses is to cut out things like alcohol, chocolate, and cigarettes. These make up a huge portion of what people spend on the shopping bill. Next, look at where you're buying your food from. Are you buying it from the corner shop or are you buying it from the premium supermarkets? Both of these options are either convenience shops, which, which means it's more expensive because you're paying for that convenience or it's a premium supermarket which means you're paying higher prices just for that brand there's, there's nothing wrong with buying from aldi or lidl and you'll probably cut your shopping bill by about 30 percent or more and next are you buying named brands or the supermarket's own brand i know the person that's responsible for running all of the lidl stores in the uk and he told me that there's basically two or three processing factories where everything is made and put into these tins or packets. And those tins or packets then get labeled by the various brands. So whether you buy the cheapest tin in the shop or the most expensive tin, it all came from the same factory. If you pay £1.40 for a tin of beans, it's exactly the same ingredients in that tin that, that costs 23 pence. All the extra money you're paying is just paying for the brand. There's, there's, there's no difference, so why buy the more expensive version? Okay, next is processed meals and takeaways. But, so back in 2010, I, I was working late every day and I couldn't really be bothered to, to cook when I'd finished. So every day I'd, I'd either buy one of these ready meals from the supermarket uh, and then just heat it up in the microwave or I'd go and get a takeaway pizza. And at lunch times, there would be this mobile van that came, came around selling sandwiches and cakes and things like that. So I'd, I'd buy my lunch from this mobile van and then I'd buy my dinner at night from the, these processed meals or from takeaways. Now, first of all, it was costing me a fortune. I was probably spending at least £20 a day, but also my, my health was getting really bad as well. I added about three stone in weight in about six months. And then what, one day I met this health coach and she told me that all of those processed meals and anything that's prepared by someone else, it all contained lots of salt and sugar. And it needs those things added because otherwise it wouldn't last very long. So by preparing your own food from scratch, you can cut out all of the costs but also eat much more healthily as well. And to take that one step further, may, maybe you can increase your skills and learn to cook it yourself. For example, that takeaway pizza you bought, that cost £20. You could learn how to make it yourself and it probably cost you less than three. And the final thing I want to say about food is, is what about the idea of growing your own food? I'll probably do another video on this subject, but if you can grow your own food, either in your back garden or maybe as a bigger community project, you could reduce your food costs to almost zero. And then next is fashion. How much do you spend every month on fashion? This isn't just buying new clothes. This is, this is getting your hair cut, getting your nails done, all of that stuff. How many clothes do you have in your wardrobe that you've, you've either never worn or that you've worn only a few times? 
I actually threw out most of my clothes. Some of them I'd never worn in 10 years. But if you've got a pool of clothes, you don't need to buy anymore. And then next, lifestyle and entertainment costs. This includes everything from your gym membership to going to the pub to dating apps to general entertainment. First of all, if it's a gym membership, you don't need it right now. You can go for a walk every day or go for a jog. It costs you nothing. I'm not saying you're never allowed to do it ever again, but this is about getting those costs down immediately so you can move into that green zone. And then next, are you, are you going out every week and spending money on getting drunk, which you regret the next day because you feel so bad? You don't need to. Here's a deal you can make with yourself. If you manage to get your spreadsheet into that green zone by doing all of these different things, then you can treat yourself with a night out, but only if it doesn't send you into that red zone again. And the final one I think we'll cover is debt. Debt costs you a fortune. You have to get rid of this debt as fast as you can and then avoid it altogether in the future. If you can't afford to pay cash for something, then you just don't buy it. That's, that's the rule you should live by from now on. So how to reduce your debt? So debt comes at various levels in terms of how much it costs. So if we look at the overall interest rate, at the highest level or most expensive level is payday lenders. Next, very close to payday lenders is, is credit cards and overdrafts. And then we've got things like car loans and, and loans to people with bad credit. Then we've got normal loans and finally we've got mortgages. So the basic rule, assuming we can't just pay it off completely, we want to focus on three things. First, we want to reduce the interest amount. Second, we want to increase our cash flow every month. But you also have to think about how much that debt is costing us in total. So if you've got a loan over four years, that's four years worth of interest that you're paying. I want you to just bear that in mind. Don't worry about it, but just bear it in mind. To give you an example, some people might pay off the loans by remortgaging the house. Now, this means instead of paying three years worth of interest, they're now paying 25 years worth of interest. So although the interest rate is lower for the mortgage, the total amount that they pay is much higher. So to this, we can do a few things. First of all, if you've got a credit card at 30% interest, you look at getting a loan at a lower interest rate. And this is normally called a debt cons consolidation loan. Now, the, the danger with doing this is after you've got this loan, you've paid off that credit card, and now you've suddenly got this credit card that's completely empty. And the danger is that you'll start spending money on that again, and you'll be in a, in a worse position than you were before. So you have to close that credit card account. Cut up that card and forget about it. And then the next thing, you can speak to these people you, that you owe money to, and you can tell them that you're struggling to sort it out, but, but you're trying to put a plan in place to pay it off. Now, because you've done that, you can normally negotiate to pay a reduced amount. So if you owe £3,000 on a credit card, let's say, you might have to pay them £1,500 to clear the debt right away. And for them to agree to this, they have to be aware that you might not be able to pay, for, pay the rest of the money in the future. There's, there's no guarantee that they'll agree to it, and it, it might affect your credit rating, and you won't be able to borrow anything from them again for a while. And they'll probably ask you how you'll pay for the debt to, to pay it off in one go. So you can tell them about the debt consolidation loan or whatever plans you, you can come up with. Okay, now I want to talk about buying at a discount. So that means buying everything you need at a discount to what you normally pay. And you can use this by, by, for example, if you're buying food, you buy it in a bulk. Now, obviously, you need a lump sum amount of money to be able to do that. Don't, don't go and buy in bulk just to put it on a credit card. It's, it's not going to be cheaper at all that way. Otherwise, maybe you buy this thing secondhand. You use places like eBay, for example. If you're learning about a new subject, maybe trying to increase your income by learning a new skill, there'll be secondhand versions or cheaper versions that, that offer the same, same information or same end result. For example, I did my HNC as distance learning, and I spent so much money on these books that I needed for the course. I, I bought them from Amazon and they were all new books. And the thing was, I only needed them for a few months. But afterwards I realized I could have got them for, for free from the library or bought them secondhand at half, half the price. Another option, maybe you're thinking about attending a training course. Well, there's people out there who teach the same subject online, either very cheaply or even for free. For example, there's thousands of videos on YouTube all for free. And there's, Learning platforms like Udemy, where, where you can learn any subject, 
whether it's about photography or about business or anything in between, and you can learn it for less than $20. The, those same training courses, you might have to spend £5,000 or up to a 20, if you did it in person uh, with one of these guru experts. Now, the final thing on expenses I want to say as an advanced strategy to reduce your cost is what I call invested costs. And that means when you reach the point of being in that green zone, you'll have money left over after you've paid for your expenses. So at that point, invested costs is about investing in ways to reduce those costs. So, for example, by investing in creating your own food garden, it will reduce your food costs every month. The end goal is to have all of your living expenses automatically paid for without you needing to work for it. Now, I want you to pause the video and go and start working on it, everything we've talked about reducing your expenses. Don't watch the rest of the video until you've got your monthly spreadsheet into that green zone. And that means reducing your expenses and increasing your income. The problem is, it doesn't matter how much you earn, if you don't use what I'm talking about in this video, your living expenses will go up to match your income. I know people that earn £100,000 every year and they still have nothing in the bank because every time they've had a wage rise, they've upgraded their lifestyle along with it. They've moved into a more expensive house. They've got a more expensive car. They've joined a more expensive club. Instead of going out once a week, they go out three times a week and they go to, to the more expensive restaurants. They, they go on more expensive holidays. And there's always an excuse that they use to justify the, this extra spend. And I'll share the secret to get out of this hamster wheel. Stop caring about what other people think about you. Stop trying to keep up with other people. If you knew the re reality of how these other people live, you'd see that they also live their life month to month on credit cards. This perception that people try to portray to the world of how amazing their life is, is probably a lot of rubbish. It's all a big psychological game trying to make other people perceive you in a certain way. Okay, so we'll come back to, to that third piece we talked about at the start. We've got our income, we've got our expenses, and the third piece is what's left. So what, what, the, how much we're saving every month. Now, first of all, I want you to set up a completely new bank account. This is, this is a bank account that you don't have a debit card for. You can't go and spend money, or if you can, it's really difficult for you to do it. And now, what if I said to you, every month without fail, as soon as you receive any amount of income, straight away you pay 10% of that income into this new bank account. This happens immediately. You don't pay expenses first, you pay this first. So if your income is £1,000 a month, you're going to automatically transfer £100 into this new account. And by the way, if you're already getting more than 10% left over every month, then instead you transfer that as, as your starting point instead. So that's what I want you to do next. Pause the video, go and set up this new account. By the way, you can get a new get a bank account that doesn't cost you anything as well. Banks such as Virgin Bank, Co-op Bank, Tide Bank, they all provide free bank accounts. And then assuming you've, you've got your monthly cash flow into that green zone, I want you to start transferring that money every month into this new account. Start the first payment today or as soon as you set up this new account. Now the challenge is, how much can you increase that leftover money every month? Everything that's left over will be paid into your new account. So your current account basically resets to zero every month. So let's say every month right now you have £100 left over that, that you've paid your exp after you've paid your expenses. So what can you do next month to increase that, that £100 and maybe cut, you, cut a new expense and you'll get it up to £120 a month? Maybe the challenge could be to double that money. So the £100 becomes £200 you save saving every month. And when you've achieved that challenge, you give yourself a, 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 little, a little reward and then set the next challenge at £400 a month saving. Now, after you've got this little system working every month, we're, we're going to rename this, this savings piece and we'll call it your emergency fund. And what we want to do is build that fund up so that we, we have between three to six months living expenses. And we, we're never going to touch that money. So the next thing I want you to do is calculate how much your living expenses are now and you can do that by looking at your spreadsheet. And then we'll, we'll keep paying our, our money into that emergency fund until it reaches that amount. Think about this like a bucket, and it, when, when the water reaches the top of the bucket, it starts to overflow. So this is, this is the emergency fund. This is the just-in-case fund. That means if something happens to your income stream, maybe you lose your job or you get injured or you can't work for a few months, then you've still got three to six months worth of expenses to, to, to let you sort things out 
without worrying about how you get how, how you'll buy food tomorrow. So how much should that emergency fund be? Should it be three months? Should it be six months? Should it be more than six months? And I think it depends on the economy. For example, if we're in a recession, there's a higher chance of losing your job and it will take longer to get a new job. So you might need that extra few months to cover that. Okay, so when we've got our emergency fund full, we want to open another new bank account and we'll call this our investment account. And now rather than sending your leftover money into your emergency fund account, now we're going to send it into our investment account. And now you've reached this stage, the idea is to start investing that, that money into this account so that those investments earn your money without you, you having to physically work for it. So some of the things we want to invest this leftover money first is firstly investing into things that reduce our costs, our, our living expenses. So like we talked about before, if you grow your own food in your garden, it might cost you £300 to set it up, but then you, your food expenses go to almost zero. So let's see, say our food costs £200 a month. And after we've built our food garden, it then reduces our food expense to £50 a month. So that means every month we're adding an extra £150 to our investment fund with it, without having to do anything for it. So next I want you to pause the video, go and look at all of your expenses in, in the spreadsheet and think about how you might be able to invest to reduce these expenses. Okay, welcome back. Next, we want to look at investments that create more cash coming in uh, for us without us having to do anything for it. So some of these investments might be buying a share on the stock market. And the important thing with this is buying, it's, it's about buying a share that pays us cash. And this is called a dividend stock. And normally you might expect to earn, say, 10% of what you invest in these stocks. So if you invested £100, you'd, you'd receive an extra £10 cash every year just for owning it. But the idea is to look at how you might increase that amount. Now, we won't go into it here, but there's a rule that you need to follow when, when investing your money into these different investments, and that's called diversification. We don't want to have all of the, all of the money invested into one thing. Ideally, you want to spread it across maybe five categories. And then inside of the, each of those categories, you want at least 10 investments. So you might be invested into 50 different individual investments. And that way, if something happens to one of them, you don't lose your money and it doesn't really affect your monthly income from those investments. Now, after we've got a good cash income every month, we might want to look at investing into what I call capital investments. And what these are, you don't receive a monthly income from these investments, but these are what grow over time and then you get a big payout sometime in the future. So, for example, you might invest £10,000 into a business and then five years later that business gets sold, your investment is now worth 200000 so, so these capital investments are designed to increase the size of that investment fund. And again, you should diversify these type of investments as well, because not only do they take much longer to see any money come, come back from them, but they're also higher risk. So, so some might, you, you might not and never, never see any return at all. Now, the ultimate goal to all of this is to have your investments pay for your living expenses. That means you're living for free. If you don't want to work, go to work, you don't have to. So let's say your living expenses are a thousand pound a month. So that's twelve thousand pound a year. So by having investments worth around sixty thousand, given given a really basic return of twenty percent, like in that example we looked at a few minutes ago, that would pay for our living expenses. But as you'll see as you start to learn more about this, you'll see that you, you earn a much higher income than twenty percent for some types of investments, especially if you can get a few of those capital investments. One thing to consider: how to protect what you've got. We won't go too deep, but, but there are ways to protect what you've already got. And this comes down to how it's structured. Most people get this wrong and they, they, they feel the need to, to own everything in the personal name. The richest billionaires in the world own nothing in their own name. And that means everything that they have is protected if things ever went wrong. Another way, for example, you might want to protect that emergency fund you've built up. So one way to do that is to buy gold with it. So if you ever need, needed it, you can just exchange that gold for your currency. That way, if the banks go bankrupt, you don't lose your money. Now, buying gold isn't, isn't a short-term thing, or it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's a store of value, and the value of it might go down by 3% next month, but overall, it should stay the same or maybe grow a little bit. The key is to, to learn about investing gold before you start investing in gold. That way, you know exactly who to buy it from and also how much it costs in different hidden fees. 
And the final thing I want to cover in this video is about debt. If you've read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he talks about there being good debt and bad debt. I'll post a link for his book, but, but just to summarize. Good debt is debt that adds money to your pocket every month. It increases your income. Bad debt is debt that reduces your money from your pocket every month. So another take on that, you never invest in assets that go down in value. So let's look at an example. A car, what do you think this is? Good debt or bad debt? A car depreciates in value and it takes money from your pocket every month. If you really need a car, maybe you can lease one instead. You're not taking on debt to own something that, that won't be worth as much in a few years' time. How about a home? Is this, is this good debt or is it bad debt? People think that their home is an asset. If you buy your home without a mortgage, it's still taking money from your pocket every month. You have other bills to pay, such as council tax, energy bills, etc. So it might go up in value, but it's still not an asset. These two areas is where most lottery winners fall over. They buy big cars and big houses without realizing that they have huge running costs too, which they don't have that monthly income to pay for. And third, a business. Do you think this is good debt or bad debt? A business hopefully goes up in value and hopefully it also adds money to your pocket every month. Now, if you buy this business with debt, so long as that debt goes, so long as that debt costs you less than, than you're earning from it, it's an asset. And in this case, it's called good debt. And it's, it's, it's important to factor in how much that debt might go up if the bank rate raises its interest rate. If the rates increase by 8%, for example, will it still be adding money to your pocket every month or will it be taking it away? That good debt might turn into bad debt if you haven't done your homework properly. And finally, the last thing on debt is interest-free credit. Now, you might buy TV or something else from the shop and get it on interest-free credit. And people normally think that that means they aren't paying anything for that debt. But the truth is, it's already built into the price of that TV. So don't fall for that scam. So that's it for this video. Hopefully you found it useful. If you've not seen my other videos, I'd recommend you watch my video about understanding market cycles next, so you can understand where we are in the market cycle and the best strategy for you to use in your own money game.